Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. This evening, we're going to talk a little bit about um, estate planning. You know, it's a very interesting time with the eco economic uh, situation being what it is, and a lot of people have uh, lost or gained, and some people have gained substantial uh, sums of money over this last year and a half. But I think one of the things that we don't think about all the time is how do we plan to take care of either what we're getting or what we have left. And so today, I'm pleased to have Kai Wessels join me here. Kai, welcome to Reference Point. Thank you, thank you. Kai is an estate planning attorney out of here in the San Jose area. And so we want to talk today, Kai, about this whole area. So maybe uh, I'm a novice to this sort of thing. It's like I know enough to, I don't even know if I know enough to be dangerous when it comes to, from a legal perspective, what you need to do and understand about things like wills, trusts, probate, and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So... I was hoping that we could have a nice conversation. You could enlighten us a little bit on what some of this stuff is all about. I'll do my best. Cool. So where do we start? I mean, what is the whole arena for wills and trusts and, and what is probate and all that kind of stuff? These are like fundamentals that I think people need to understand, yes? Exactly. So I guess the best place to start is to describe what the probate process is. And the probate process is, another way of looking at it is the court-supervised distribution of assets. It's where an individual goes to the court, asks to be appointed as a personal representative, and then marshals all the assets together, and at the end of the process, asks the court to distribute the assets to the rightful uh, beneficiaries. Okay. And, and probate occurs primarily when you have no will, no estate plan in place, in other words, when the person dies intestate, or when you have a will, and only a will. So in other words, that's, that's where the state decides, and it comes in and kind of takes over and says, okay, here's what we're going to do with uh, what this guy had accumulated over the years. So that's pretty right. The, uh, the state, uh, most states have a default system in place that if a person doesn't have a will in place or a trust, then they assume that the person intended to give it to their spouse mm -hmm. or their children or their grandparents and it goes there's a whole litany of people who uh, uh, inherit in okay. successive order okay. and it's based on the concept that they first want to give it to family members okay and so in general terms is that like a good way to go is that to, to just allow that to happen is that uh, sufficient for most people or is it really something that you don't want to go there if you don't have to. Yeah, you should try to avoid that whenever possible. One, you want to make clear who you want to be the executor, the manager of your assets upon your death. Uh, so naming that person in the will is always a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Making clear who you want to be the beneficiaries of your estate is mm -hmm. very important, as opposed to letting the state assume for you who are going to be your beneficiaries. Okay. So that's also important and th that's basically what a will will do is make sure it identifies who the ex executor is, who the beneficiaries are, and also if you have young children under the age of 21, mm -hmm. you can name the guardians of those children inside your will. And you can have the guardians for the children and also the guardians uh, for the assets of the children. So oh, those can be the same people or different people. Is, is this something that you need to think about only when you're married and have children or only when you get, you know, I, I mean, w when should somebody actually be, be contemplating the concept of uh, establishing a will or, or a trust? And we'll get into that in a minute to, uh, to give me clarity on what the distinction between the two is. But is this something that, you know, um, when should you start thinking about this sort of thing? Well, that's a good question, and its practicality is one of the important uh, factors as well. Is one should have a will in place as soon as possible, but then you have to think about how much does it cost? Is it better off paying my rent or buying clothes as opposed to paying an attorney four hundred to six hundred dollars to draft a will? Mm -hmm. uh, if you have very little money. You know, obviously a simple will is, is better than having nothing, mm -hmm. uh, but it's up to each individual where they want to put that money. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, of course, it becomes much more important to have a will in place or possibly a trust. I guess that's probably true, especially as you start 
um, moving away from just being uh, a sole individual and you, you start, you know, you get married, you start having a family, or even if you're involved in some way in more of a community-like activity and you may have some assets, whether you're married or not, I guess it becomes more of something that eventually you should start thinking about. Is that Ab absolutely. One thing, if you are a young person without any very many assets, you may want to think about giving all of your assets to one individual, get mm -hmm. more, make it more beneficial for that one individual, as opposed to divvying it up between you know, maybe your family members, so you get less bang for the buck. Right. So when you're young, that may be one reason to have a will. So let's talk, a, we've, we mentioned will, and a will, I guess, is really a statement that the individual makes of what they want to have done with their assets, wh whatever they've accumulated at the point in time when they've passed on. Exactly. So how does that differ from, from a trust? Because we hear this stuff about trusts and what, you know, there's commercials on TV and there's, you know, you see it in the news and stuff, but what is it really and what's the main distinction between the two? A trust is sort of a souped up will. It does a lot more than what a will does. And there are basically four major things that a trust does that a will doesn't do. Okay. The will is public, namely it has to be lodged with the court. You have to go through the probate process of disclosing your assets and identifying the beneficiaries. A trust, you don't have to do that. Hmm. So, for example, Michael Jackson died. He had, has a large estate, and he, they filed the will, but, or lodged the will, but all it says is, I give everything to the trust. Uh, Nobody knows how large his estate is and who's going to inherit those assets. Uh -huh. So a trust is private. You don't have to disclose it to anybody. So to some people, that's very important. Another thing that a trust does is it staggers or delays distribution to the intended beneficiaries. So for example, let's say you have a $4 million estate when you include your life insurance. Mm -hmm. And you have two kids. So mm -hmm. each of them is going to inherit $2 million. With a will, the longest you can delay that distribution is to age 25. So at age 25, each of them is going to get $2 million. That can be a lot of money that is subject to misuse, abuse, or whatever, mm -hmm. of a 25-year-old. Sure. With a trust, what you can do is delay the distributions. You can, for example, say the child will get income of that $2 million uh -huh. until age 30, and then maybe at age 30, they get a third of that $2 million. At age 35, they get another third, and at age 40, they get that last third. That's a strong, you know, a strong component of that trust does that a will doesn't do. Mm. And a trust also, what I hinted to was, well, I didn't hint to, but I mentioned probate. Mm -hmm. It also avoids probate. Vo what do you a mean avoids? Oh, av av avoids. Avoids, okay. avoids <laughs> probate. And that becomes important when you have a very large estate because, or large estates, because the attorney's fees and the administrator fees are based upon the size of the estate. So at some point in time, the estate becomes so large that probate avoidance is an important thing uh, to do. Is so to if, avoid if paying you those have to fees. go through the probate process, if I got what you're saying, if you have to go through the probate process, which means in, that that it's a state administered or overseen activity that includes attorneys and judges and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Court supervised. Court supervised. Okay. So then, th those people need to get compensated for it exactly. and there is some formulation based on it that so you could actually have a substantial chunk of whatever that estate is going off in directions that had never been intended right the attorneys get a percentage of the estate the personal representative gets a percentage they're small percentages mm -hmm. but it adds up yeah right so you can have a million dollar estate and have fees of fifteen thousand dollars or so so it adds up fairly quickly uh, and more than what an attorney would normally get if it were a trust administration type situation. Right. Okay. So is that all four of the things? No, nope, that's uh, that three of the four. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and the the fourth one is estate tax um, avoidance or at least minimization. Okay. The if you're a couple, married couple, a husband and wife, and if you have over $3.5 million, then you can avoid 
estate taxes or minimize the estate taxes uh, by having a trust. When you say 3.5 million, that's everything. Earlier you said something about including the proceeds from life insurance and stuff like that. Is that count in what you just said? Exactly. So you add up the net value of the estate, including most of times, including life insurance. Mm -hmm. And if it's, uh, if it's less than $3.5 million, all that together, then there are no estate taxes for that individual. Uh -huh. okay. So it's only above $3.5 million that there are estate taxes. Okay. With a couple, if you do a trust, you can double that exemption amount. Oh. So now the exemption amount is $7 million. Okay. So if a couple dies, let's say within a year, and they have exactly $7 million, then they save $3.5 million that's not subject to estate taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, estate taxes currently is at 45%. So that's 45 the tax rate. 45%? Percent. Is that that's federal? That's federal and state combined. And state combined, 45%. So now that $3.5 million that's subject to estate taxes uh -huh. would be, adds up to about $1,575,000. So you're saving over... $1.5 million, All right. assuming you have an estate $7 million or above, right. in estate taxes by having a trust. You know, you talk about those kind of numbers, and, and they seem like really big numbers, $3.5 million. But if you're living here in, in the Santa Clara Valley, uh, and you own a piece of property in Los Gatos or Cupertino or Los Altos or, you know, whatever... I mean, right there, you've got some asset that is uh, almost half, probably, of what you're talking about. And then when you add things like your insurances and various, $3.5 million can come around pretty quickly. Really fast, Life, especially when you include the life insurance and your IRAs, 401ks, there you go. stock yeah. options. What's left of the 401ks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and everything else. Yeah. Well, hopefully, they're going to grow again, too. Uh, exactly. But see, now, this is a really good point, because when we sit here and talk about this sort of thing, people... I think, and, and I'm a case in point, needing to think um, longer term. You know, when you get into an economic crunch like we have right now, you think your, your, your field of focus tends to kind of pull in and it's more narrow. It's like, how am I going to make it through the next couple of months? What mm -hmm. are we going to do about this holiday season? What's going to, ha you know, as opposed to what do I want to be five years, 10 years, 25 years from now? What are my retirement plans? Okay. Right, exactly. But... You never know when your card's going to come up, mm -hmm. right? And so thinking about these types of things I, would seem to me would make a lot of sense for people. Right? Yes. I had a situation where a person died uh, a couple of weeks before his wedding and fortunately had come to me just before getting married. Uh -huh and changed his estate plan to give everything to his fiance. Ah. And then he died between the signing of the will and, and this estate plan and uh, the wedding. Oh, wow. It made a tremendous difference because oh, sure. he was very quite well off. And so his fiance was at least provided for as opposed to the way it was originally designed. Yeah. Now, you said something a little bit earlier when you were giving the example of the Michael Jackson scenario. Where mm -hmm. You mentioned that he has... Uh, had an estate, uh, excuse me, a trust, but then there was a will that said, I'm leaving everything to the trust. Exactly. It, should you have both of these? Yeah, good, good point. When you have a trust, you always have wills as well. So you have, what, what a trust is, it's more like a business entity. Okay. Uh, and eventually does get its separate tax ID number upon when it becomes irrevocable. And so what you have to do is you have to put your assets into the trust. You have to retitle all of your important or large assets. Uh -huh. For example, your real estate. Uh -huh. You have to now put into the trust, file a new grant deed or record a new grant deed, naming the trust as the owner of that asset. Oh, okay. Some assets are not going to be put into the trust. They're either too small or they're forgotten. And so what you have are also wills, mm -hmm. a will for each of the individuals, of the couple, and they pour over, and that's what is called a pour over oh. will. They pour over from those left out assets and put them into the trust. I see. So Michael Jackson did have a will which basically said everything that's not in trust, I put into trust. Got it. Okay. So what's the difference between a will, I've heard this other term, living will? 
Yeah, and that in California doesn't really exist. It's, ah. it's, it's a misnomer. It's what in California is called an advanced health care directive. Ah, so that's okay. basically the document that you use for medical purposes. So if you become incapacitated, then somebody on your behalf can make the medical decisions for you. Mm -hmm. So that's what advanced health care directive is, and that's what a living will in other states Okay. It's called. So it's just the terminology thing. It's confusing. We don't use it here in California. Exactly okay. Right. Yeah. All right. So how do you determine which is better in your situation? Do I just go with will? Should I go with the trust? What I mean, how do you what do you have to go through to kind of figure that out? Well, one is the cost factor. How much money do you have uh, to spend? A will typically costs between four hundred and six hundred dollars. A trust or trust package, because it includes wills, includes putting the assets into the trust, mm -hmm. it includes a lot of secondary documents, that costs between $2,000 and $5,000. Mm -hmm. You can get it for less, but then you know you get what you pay for. And so, yeah. so in other words, if you're trying to do it all by yourself, uh, you might. Yes. And I think that's an interesting point. And by the way, I want to remind the folks out there that if they have any questions regarding what it is we're talking about here, Send your questions in to us at info at referencepointtv.com. We'll make sure Kai gets those questions and then we can get answers to you if you have anything that you want to know more about th this topic. But, but let's go back to that. So um, trying to do something like this on your own, it, I don't know that it's... Because you can go out and you can get the books, How to, how to Write a Will, and you know the, the Dummies Guide to just about anything that's out there. Right. Um, I'm guessing that that might not be the smartest thing that you could do and when it comes to trying to protect your assets. Right. A will, you just might be able to pull it off because it's not that complex. And as long as, I haven't looked at the software, but as long as you're pretty smart and you, you're following some guidelines, you can do it. Mm -hmm. A trust is virtually impossible for the average individual to do. It, you, you you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's you mess it up so many in so many different ways. I can that see how that could a, be. It's a problem, and then you spend end up the heirs spending spend a lot more money trying to figure fix out the problems what was going as on. opposed to the individual who tried to save the two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars. But it sounds like it makes sense for someone to really consider the trust as, as, as if, I mean, is there a rule of thumb that you can give us? At what point should you really be thinking about that versus just having a will? Yeah. If you have 500000 or below, I'm fairly conservative. I would recommend that you do a will there, even though you do go to probate, and so you do have some probate fees. They're not that large. Mm -hmm. You dig, do get court-supervised distribution so that there's somebody looking over your shoulder mm -hmm. or the administrator's shoulder to make sure they're doing it right. Mm -hmm. The delay one year isn't that bad. It takes about nine months to a year to do a probate process. Nine months to a year to go through the process. To wow. do the process. It isn't that bad. Uh, it's usually painless. There are usually life insurance or other things that if you really need the money, you can get at quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's not that bad. Trusts also take time to administer. Mm -hmm. So for assets below 500000 I generally recommend doing a will. Mm -hmm. Between five hundred and million dollars, it becomes a gray area. It really depends upon the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, do they have kids? What, where are they in their life um, life cycle? Mm -hmm. Above a million dollars, I generally start recommending trusts because of the reasons I mentioned, especially the delayed distribution of assets to their minor children, mm -hmm. the probate avoidance, which can add up to being a lot of money. And also, if you have above a million dollars, who knows when that hits the $3.5 million mark. Right, right. And where then you're going to have some estate taxes. And by the way, I should mention that the federal government is working on revising the estate tax plan or the estate tax issues. Mm -hmm. Right now, the guess is that it'll stay at $3.5 million, but okay. we simply do not know what's going to be happening in the f near future. Nobody really knows what Congress is going to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you're subject to guessing a lot of times. Right. So, okay, so um, 
I'm, I'm suspecting that this is not one of those types of documents that you do it once and you stick it in a drawer and you never look at it again. Um, life circumstances change, um, and whether it's a will or a trust, is this, some, this is something that you should visit on a regular basis, yes? It depends, again. With a will, one of the benefits of the will is that it's a fairly simple document. And so as long as the things haven't changed drastically, you, know, you still want to give it to your children, mm -hmm. all that you get along with all your children, uh, and uh, the executor that you've named is still alive and capable of managing the estate upon your death. Mm -hmm. If all those things stay the same and your assets are generally also the same, below that $3.5 million mark or below the million dollars, then you can put away that will and forget about it for a while. In my situ personal situation, my father drafted a will 40 years ago, mm. and it was still perfectly good 40 years later. Mm. So it's doable. With a trust, it's not. Mm. You have to continuously manage those assets. You have to make sure that the assets are in trust so that if you sell your house and that's mm -hmm. a trust asset, then you have to make sure that then if you buy a new house that you put that asset, new right. house, into the trust. You have to make sure that when you change brokers that you put the new brokerage accounts into oh. the trust. So it's ongoing maintenance to make sure that the assets are in the trust. Also upon the death of the first spouse, there is major trust administration. It's not the time to forget about your trust. In mm -hmm. fact, that's a major point in your life where you have to worry about doing proper trust administration. And so, and that's tough because yeah. right then this, grieving, this spouse is usually grieving, right. is in a weakened mental state, possibly weakened physical state, and that's when you have to start uh, doing major trust administration. Got it. And so that's where having someone that knows, like yourself, that really understands this sort of a thing becomes a very key component because, again, uh, do the laws change regularly on this sort of thing? Like some other areas, ta other tax laws and things that got changed all the time. And is that something that you have to be concerned about? Yes, with the exemption amount, yes. The $3.5 million e exemption. That can change next year. Right. Uh, everything else stays basically the same. Wills have been around s since England. Mm. Uh, we've, it's basically the same procedure that comes from England and is being enforced here in California today, mm -hmm. in addition to the community property laws that comes from Spain. But so we have those that document and those set of rules in place. But what does change are the estate taxes. Got it. And that's something you have to be cognizant of. Got it. And you had mentioned something to me a little bit before the show, uh, and that's a topic I think we want to touch on a little bit. It had to do with uh, what if. Your, part of what your, your bequeathment is is to like um, uh, friends or non-family members or whatever, or maybe a nonprofit organization or something like that. How do those things come into play, and what are some of the, the concerns and issues you have to think or about? Pitfalls. Or pitfalls. Yeah. The, what happened in California, and probably in other states as well, is that uh, individuals would take advantage of primarily the elderly. And those individuals would have a special connection to the elderly. Right. Those would be the health care providers. Right. Also attorneys, uh, also fiduciaries, anybody with a fiduciary relationship would take advantage of the elderly and somehow get themselves involved in the estate. Right. And there wasn't enough evidence to prove that these people exerted some type of undue influence over the elderly. Mm -hmm. And so California enacted some laws to protect that, to ma permit, make it more difficult for these types of, types of individuals to inherit. Mm -hmm. So now when you draft a will and you want to give it to your friends, especially if you're an elderly person, mm -hmm. You should have it reviewed, and sometimes it's required to be reviewed by another attorney oh. to make sure that those individuals are entitled to inherit, that they are not uh, exerting any undue influence. Because those friends can be attorneys, especially health care providers who sure. are somehow 
being kind to these elderly people, which is, of course, the reason why an elderly person may want to give right. some of their assets to this kind person. And you're saying that that's something that needs to be or should be reviewed at the time that it's created? Exactly. So what you need to do is you have to have a second attorney whose job is only to review the estate plan mm -hmm. and then sign a certificate of independent review saying that there is no undue influence, that this is a kosher transfer from, you know, that the person that knows individual. what they're doing and that's what they want Got to do. It. Well, we're just about out of time today. We only have a little, a little less than two minutes left uh, t to talk here. And I, but, but this has been fascinating information and it's, and I'd like to get a little quick summary uh, if we can in the last minute or so that we have here because it sounds like what we've got is um, it is something that's important for just about anyone to do. Absolutely. Okay, whether you're um, middle-aged, whether you're just out of college, whether whatever it happens to be, you need to be thinking about how to manage and protect your assets, whether they're large or whether they're, they're modest. You need to actually think about this at some point in time. And it's this process that is uh, complicated enough that you should actually look for professional assistance in it but it's something that everybody should do. So, Kai, is there anything else that you want to convey to the uh, listening audience or the viewing audience before we wrap up here today? No, I guess the only thing I want to say is that probate is not necessarily a scary thing. It's a court-supervised distribution of assets, so the court's involved in it. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I do encourage everybody to get a uh, will or a trust in place, to have an estate plan in place. Fantastic. I think that's a great way to end up. So, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for joining us this evening. Again, remember, you can send your questions into info at referencepointtv.com, and we'll make sure Kai gets those questions. So thank you very much for, enjoy for joining us here again on Reference Point, and we'll see you next time.